Hi, everybody, and good evening. I think we'll get going. Um, welcome to the 2018 Wednesday the Genome Public Talk Series. Uh, my name is Ilhanan Bornstein. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Genome Sciences uh, and the organizer of this um, seminar uh, series. Um, and um, I think that this year we really have a wonderful and very diverse set of talks for you, uh, ranging from using machine learning to study the genome, to understanding part of your genome that are archaic, um, to the genetics of autism, and finally using genomic tools uh, for forensic sciences. Um, before I introduce the speakers for uh, tonight, I want to just start with a quick, uh, with a few quick logistics. So first of all, uh, we will have some time for question and answers at the end of the talk, and so whatever bothers you about the talk, feel free to ask, and, and our speaker will be happy to answer. Um, there are always a few people that just don't have time to get uh, their, their, quench their question in, and so um, our speaker uh, was kind enough to agree to stay after the talk, and will be, ha be happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, I also assume that some of you might have questions about genomics and about the department that might not be directly related to the talk. Um, there are quite a few people in the audience from this department, faculty, postdoc, and students, and they will be happy to address those questions. Uh, we're trying to make all of these people put name tags, which I don't think we succeeded in. Uh, but if you find somebody with a name tag, go introduce yourself and ask whatever question you have. And if this person is not in the department, just made a new friend anyway. Um, to facilitate um, this kind of interaction, as always, we will have cookies and coffees and some juice outside. And so feel free to enjoy this refreshment. Um, finally, um, um, we usually have um, high school students in the audience that um, need to provide their teacher with some confirmation that they attended this talk. And so unlike previous year where they swarmed the speaker at the end to get a signature, uh, we decided to make it a bit more formal. And so we prepare those uh, formal certificates for attending the talk. Um, if you need something like this, um, go to Justin, this guy over there, at the end of the talk, and he'll be happy to provide you with this certificate. Um, and so with that, um, I'm really happy and, and, and have a great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Bill Noble, a professor of genome sciences. Uh, Bill did his undergrad at Stanford. Um, like many computational people, he um, had some time between the undergrad and going to grad school working in different companies. But what is not so common is that he also spent a couple of years as part of the US Peace Corps teaching math and English um, in Africa. Um, he then started his PhD in UC San Diego. Um, he liked the area, and so he ended up, he, he continued to a quick postdoc at UC Santa Cruz. Um, he then joined a computer science department at Columbia University, but very quickly realized that there is no place like Seattle and joined the Faculty of Genome Sciences at 2002. Uh, he is a recipient of multiple awards, including the prestigious NSF uh, Career Award. Um, his research group is, is um, focused on developing statistical inference and machine learning method to study various uh, biological processes at the molecular level. And, and I also want to add that I think uh, Bill's work is not only a wonderful example for the potential of computational work to address really fundamental question in data mining in genomic science, but also to the kind and process uh, of interaction between different kind of sciences and collaboration between computational people and experimentalists that not only bring really creative solutions to various problems, but also very creative questions that they um, are, are answering. I'm sure that Bill will talk about some of those uh, topics in his talk. And so uh, with that, I just want to um, invite Bill to the podium, and I hope that you'll um, welcome him with that. Thank you. All right, so um, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, pleased to start out the Wednesday evenings at the Genome this year. Uh, and as the title implies, I'm going to tell you about sort of a relationship between stuff going on in computer science and specifically in machine learning uh, and the work that goes on in this department and elsewhere and trying to make sense of the human genome. Uh, but before I dive into that, I thought I would tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from to give you a sense of, uh, Elhanan alluded to this a little bit, to give you a sense of what my background is like. Um, so I started out um, in uh, graduate school doing artificial intelligence. I was in the AI lab at UCSD, working in a subfield of AI that was just starting to be called machine learning. Um, these days, people think of machine learning and AI as the same thing, but actually AI is, is broader. 
than the, the subfield of machine learning, which is where deep neural networks uh, have been developed. At the time, my dad was telling me, my dad who's sitting right there, was telling me that I should get involved in all this genetic stuff. There's a lot going on in genetics. And I said, Dad, you know, I took, I took AP chemistry. I taught physics for a while for high school students, but I've, I haven't had a biology, biology class since sophomore year in high school, so that's not going to happen. Uh, now, what I wanted to do was artificial life, which was basically evolving creatures in the computer. Right? I thought that was cool, and, uh, and I did a lot of that, and then went to a couple conferences and realized that there wasn't a lot of rigor in that particular field. There were just people evolving stuff and then saying it's cool. Um, <laughs> which was cool, but did, you know, didn't seem to be going anywhere. So I was left at the end of my first year in graduate school without really much of a direction. And I got an email from one of the professors saying, I need a, I have funding for a summer student to work on hidden Markov modeling of protein sequences. Well, I'd worked for a while in the speech recognition industry where hidden Markov models had been uh, developed to a large extent. So I knew all about that kind of probability model. I knew nothing about protein sequences, but I decided to sign up for the summer um, and that ended up being my PhD, and then it ended up being my career. Um, and so that's how I'm, I come to you today, sort of, you know, by a circuitous path, where by now I, I still haven't taken any biology courses except for that one in high school. <laughs> but, uh, but I've learned a lot of biology by working with colleagues here in genome sciences and elsewhere. Um, and so the way I've structured the talk today is sort of in three parts. I'm going to um, first tell you sort of I've got the deep neural network part and the human genome part and then sort of how they work together, right? So the first thing I want to do is sort of describe to you a little background about DNA and genomes and genetics, right? This is supposed to be a public lecture, so I, I know there are some of you from genome sciences, so you can close your eyes now for a while or, or, or heckle me if I say things that are t egregiously wrong. But uh, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. And then I'll go through kind of a, a history of neural networks and deep neural networks to bring us up to the current stage um, and how they sort of uh, um, merged together or started working together a few years ago. So, um, so let's start. I'll start in uh, 2003 for genomics. This is a picture of the Human Genome Library, sort of a sculpture kind of or a work of art at the Wellcome Collection um, to, to commemorate the completion uh, of the Human Genome Project. So the Human Genome Project, you may remember the announcement, 2003, the Human Genome has been completed. This was a project that took about 10 years, cost about $2.7 billion in 1991 dollars. Um, and what that gave us was this. This is a bunch of printed pages listing the bases, A, C, G, and T, uh, for all the chromosomes in a human cell, okay? so. Printed out, it's about 3.1 billion bases, and that's what it takes to, to write them all down on pieces of paper. Uh, I don't think many people actually read it uh, that way anyway. Um, but, you know, the, the idea was now we've got the genome, right? Okay, so a gene is a region of the DNA that codes for, typically codes for a protein. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but you can think of it sort of as a gene is sort of a functional unit in the genome. And the, the suffix ohm is kind of a Greek, it's kind of a neo-Greek suffix that means the entirety or everything. So the, the idea is the genome is all of the genetic components in, uh, in a given cell. So each one of your cells has all 3.1 billion bases of the genome in it, or at least uh, some variation of that genome. Um, so, of course, the, the subsequent problem of all this was how are we going to make sense of it? So this is David Botstein. He's one of the people who was involved in the, the Human Genome Project. He was asked to summarize in a, in a nano lecture. He was given seven words to summarize the Human Genome Project, and these are the words that he came up with. Genome bought the book hard to read, right? So at that point, we had a, a, a book or a whole bunch of books, and we couldn't really make much sense of it. And so the questions we wanted to answer were things like, uh, how many genes are there in the human genome? Where are they exactly in the genome? What, is, what do each of these genes do? How do they get turned on and off in different situations? If you have a developmental process happening and some genes need to turn off or on, or if there's changes in the environment and the genes need to respond, where are the switches that are responsible for turning these genes on and off? 
how do those switches work? Um, and then, of course, the big question is, is there anything else in there we don't know about yet, right? I mean, there's a lot of DNA there. Maybe there are things in there that we haven't even uh, dreamt of yet. <clears throat> so what became clear at that point was, ironically, yeah, we just spent 10 years generating a bunch of data, but we need more data, right? So the problem was we had one kind of data, which was the letters in the genome, but we didn't really know all the other biochemical properties of, uh, of the genome. So we didn't know about things like what other molecules are interacting with the genome where, or how is the DNA structured inside of the cell. Um, we, of course, we have the human genome sequenced, but obviously we don't have identical genome sequences. Each of us differs, and it's approximately one every thousand bases or so. And so getting some idea of the variation of the genomes across the human population or even between species was an important part of that data gathering process. Um, so in particular, it turns out that, you know, DNA is actually pretty long and the nucleus is small. So if you take the DNA from one cell and stretch it out, uh, it's about as tall as I am. It's about two meters long. Uh, in one cell, and of course, the, the nucleus of a cell, depends on the cell, but an average cell, maybe it's about six microns, right? So six millionths of a meter long. Um, so if you think of it in terms of uh, more macroscopic things, if you had a nucleus that was the size of a penny and you unstretched all the DNA, you'd have to walk an hour and 15 minutes down to the Ballard Bridge to stretch out that DNA. So it's a, a lot of DNA that's all crunched down inside the cell and understanding how that gets folded and why it gets folded that particular way was part of the sort of data generating process that we needed to go through. Now, <clears throat> as it turns out, as during the subsequent decade or so, there was another revolution in genomics, um, which involved, uh, it was a, a technology driven revolution that involved essentially developing new methods for measuring DNA sequence. And so what this graph is showing is the rate of uh, increase of DNA sequencing speeds uh, for different kinds of technology over the years from 2000 to extrapolated to 2025. Um, and I guess I don't have a pointer here. I have a little one. I don't know if you can see that. But the, the, um, the, the blue line here is what would happen if it was doubling every 18 months. So that's the famous Moore's law that you hear about for computer uh, capacity. And you can see that the way that this line has been going before is not the same slope as that blue line. Uh, one of the instrument manufacturers uh, estimates that it's going to double every 12 months. If you just extrapolate the line, it's more like doubling every seven months. But the point is the ability to measure DNA sequences has increased dramatically over the past decade. So we got a ton of data, which is what we needed. And it's not just measuring the sequence itself, but using this kind of technology, you can measure lots of different properties of the DNA. So it gives us a much more complete picture of what's going on inside the cell. <clears throat> okay, so that takes us to, let's say about 2012 or so. We've now spent another 10 years, we're generating tons of data, it's still, uh, it's now an even longer book, maybe even harder to read. Now let's switch over to the neural network side of the equation for a little bit. So on the, on the neural net side of things, I'm gonna go back a little bit farther in time just to give you a sense of where these things come from. Um, this is a famous paper from 1957. Um, well, I guess it's, it appeared in print in 1958. It was invented in 1957. Um, the Perceptron, a Probabilistic Model for Information Storage and Organization in the Brain by Frank Rosenblatt. So the Perceptron was a simple algorithm um, and actually an instantiation of that algorithm in a hardware artifact, which there's a picture of here called the, the Mark I Perceptron. Uh, and what it was was a, essentially a pattern recognition engine. It was hooked up to a CCD camera and you could train it to recognize uh, digits different kinds of letters. Um, and what was interesting about it, or what, the po what Frank Rosenblatt's point was, was not to say, oh, we're capable of recognizing digits. People had done that before. His point was, we can do it in a way that sort of mimics the way the brain works. So his idea was that we want to, he called them perceptron as a sort of an, an analog to a neuron. 
And the idea is that in your brain, you have each neuron has these components where there are dendrites and axon terminals, and there's signal coming in, and there's some kind of activation that happens, and then a signal that goes out of the neuron. And the perceptron model was designed to sort of mimic this in a very simple mathematical way. So you have on the left three inputs, which would be numerical values. Maybe they're coming from a sensor from the camera. They, they get combined with some mathematical function, usually a very, very simple function. Uh, and then there's some output. And maybe that output is sent to multiple different places, or maybe it just goes um, to the output that you're interested in. Um, it turns out one of the things that Rosenblatt proved was the uh, perceptron convergence theorem, which showed that this uh, learning mechanism, when they put a bunch of these units together, would always converge to a solution. Um, and the kinds of solutions that it would converge to were something like this. This is just taken from the um, Wikipedia page for, per for perceptrons to give you an idea of what kind of thing it's doing. But imagine you have a bunch of pictures of cats and dogs, and you're trying to learn to recognize the difference between them. Each of the features of that image might come in. Maybe you, you can get some feature that corresponds to ear shape or some feature that corresponds to the overall size of the, of the creature that you're looking at. And all the perceptron it does is draws a line, right, between the dogs on the right, the cats on the left. So it's really a fancy way of drawing lines. The reason it works well is because typically you have a lot more than two features. You might have thousands of them. So you're drawing a line, but it's not in a two-dimensional space. It's in this uh, mathematical, it's called a hyperspace, a space with lots and lots of dimensions, which gives it a lot of power to learn interesting patterns. So there was a lot of excitement about this in the 60s as people developed algorithms and improved ways of doing things like the perceptron. Um, until 1969, when Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert published a book called uh, Perceptrons. And uh, there was a lot of, there's a lot of content to this book. I have not read the whole book, but I've learned about it in multiple classes. And I can tell you the main take home message was essentially that, um, that perceptrons are great, but they're not so great. And it's sort of a little bit obvious in just looking at this picture. The problem is if you have, you know, dogs on the right and cats on the left, what happens if, you know, another little dog comes in and he's in the wrong side, right? If you're just drawing lines, it turns out the perceptron can't separate this problem. This is called the exclusive or problem. And so the idea of the, the book was, okay, perceptrons might seem great, but they're fundamentally limited in the kinds of problems they can solve. And so this essentially led to the first great winter of the, the development of neural networks. Everybody stopped working on them and said, oh, they're, they're fundamentally flawed. Let's go do other stuff. Okay, so that was 1969. Through the 70s, more or less, not much happened in neural net land. Um, around the early 80s, um, two guys, Dave Rummelhart and James McClellan, these are the only picture I could find of them. Uh, this is from uh, Dave Rummelhart's obituary from a few years ago. This is them in the 70s with a couple other guys. They had started talking, about, they're um, cognitive psychologists, and they started um, looking more into these neural network stuff because they're interested in brains, and they kind of rediscovered the, um, the idea that actually you can train a perceptron as long as you make it more complicated. So you, what you do is rather than just have one set of units, all the inputs come, they go through perceptrons, and that's the output. Now you have one set of perceptrons, and they get linked to another set of perceptrons. And with two sets of units, now suddenly you can do stuff like this, where you're essentially, you, if, you, if your data were those blue and red dots in a 2D plane, using the, the multi-layer neural network, you can translate it to a higher dimension where now you can draw a straight line, or in this case a plane, that separates the two classes of points that weren't separable before. Okay, so in 1986, they published a nature paper that sort of described this algorithm for training these multi-layer networks called backpropagation. For a long time, a lot of people, including myself, thought they'd kind of invented backpropagation. In fact, it was well known in the 50s and 60s. The same algorithm was used for calculating uh, thrust for the Apollo uh, rockets. 
Um, and so essentially what they were just doing is saying, listen, you can use this backpropagation algorithm to train more complicated neural networks to solve real problems. Okay, so um, that was sort of the, the, the beginning of the excitement for the sort of the second wave. So when I was an undergrad at Stanford, one of my friends was working in Dave Remmelhart's lab. That was a big deal. You know, he was, a, he was sort of on the crest of his popularity at that time. Um, and so they were, a lot of people were using them and a lot of people were excited about them despite some significant problems. So one thing, it's expensive in a, in a computational sense to train these things. They take uh, a lot of data and a lot of time to run this backpropagation algorithm. Um, you can't really prove a lot about them. You can still prove this convergent theorem which says they converge to an answer, but you can't prove that it's the best answer in any sort of meaningful sense. Uh, it's, just, it's an answer that separates the two classes you're interested in. Um, and another big problem was that you, know, you, you usually train them using some random initialization, and depending on what random initial, initialization you use, you get a dis different answer each time, which is kind of frustrating if you're trying to solve a, a particular problem. And in particular, there, <coughs> there are lots of choices like how many perceptron units should you put in or how many layers should you use, and there wasn't any good theory for how to do any of that. Um, but they worked really well. And so people used them a lot uh, despite that, and uh, they were pretty popular from mid-80s through the early 90s. By the time I got back from the Peace Corps, I started my graduate work in 94, I went to UCSD, which was where Rummelhart and McClellan first started their work, so there were a lot of neural net people there, but it was definitely on the decline. I got the sense that we were kind of an outpost of neural network holdouts in the mid-90s, and most people had already started turning to other kinds of methods, things with names like uh, Bayesian networks that are probabilistic, or things called support vector machines that had better theory for how they would, they would work in a learning system. Um, and so <coughs> that was sort of the mid-90s was the, the second winter of neural networks where things sort of petered out. Um, but the difference is that I think throughout the 90s and the, the noughts, um, there were still a subgroup of people who continued to sort of uh, carry a torch for neural networks. People like Jeff Hinton at the University of Toronto continued to use uh, multi-layer neural networks to solve problems. When I moved to Seattle in 2002, I remember visiting Microsoft Research and they were talking about neural networks at a time when there were almost no sort of academic papers being published in this area. Um, even as late as 2009, I was talking to a colleague today who was recalling going to one of the big machine learning conferences in 2009 to a deep learning, deep neural network workshop, and there was almost no one there. Because at that point, uh, people still thought of neural networks as sort of an outmoded thing that was popular in the 90s. And the funny thing is that during this time, uh, there were sort of quietly some changes happening. Um, and the, the sort of the third phase of neural networks was starting to be born even as people weren't really noticing. Um, and that was really driven by two different phenomena. One of them had to do with the advent of, of GPUs, a different kind of processor in the computer um, that lets you do neural network training much more quickly. So these came out, or, or actually people started noticing them in the neural network uh, community sort of in the early 2000s. And the, the effect of a GPU when you're training a neural network is that something that would have taken you a week, you can now do in an hour. Um, which is a huge advantage when you don't have a good theory for how to set up your model. Because now you can try 24 things a day instead of one thing a week and try to figure out what works well. And that makes a huge difference in terms of just being able to experiment with different kinds of possible solutions. Um, and so that was going on at the same time that um, the data was also um, being generated. So the other big change besides the speed up of GPUs was that the world was, was being uh, inundated with more data. So I already told you about genomics, right? By 2012, we had all this data, weren't sure what to do with it, but of course, genomics was hardly the first one to the big data bandwagon, right? Uh, companies like uh, Netflix, Amazon, Google were all recognizing that with the internet, they had huge amounts of data that they couldn't make much sense out of. And it turns out that 
neural networks, especially in conjunction with GPUs, were capable of processing these huge data sets and starting to make sense out of them. Um, and so those two things um, were really what drove what's the current, the, the beginning of the current third phase of deep neural networks um, or of neural networks in general. And I would say that probably the turning point came uh, for many in the field <coughs> around 2011. So when I worked in speech recognition in the uh, late 80s and 90s, early 90s, uh, that field was driven by these bake-offs that were run by DARPA, which is the defense, defense um, research program uh, the US government runs. These bake-offs were an annual thing where all these uh, different groups would try to compete to see how well they could perform at speech recognition tasks. So they would do things like record conversations with uh, people calling in to buy airline tickets. This was a nice setting for speech recognition because you could, there weren't that many uh, vocabulary words. You know, there's some names of cities, but there's not that much, you don't have small talk with the person you're buying um, the airline tickets from. And so the DARPA bake-off became the focus of the field and whoever did the best in that challenge um, was sort of the winner for the next year and that was worth a lot in terms of career and so on. And uh, all the stuff that you saw even in the, I think it was in the late 90s that uh, commercial speech recognition hit the shelves in, in sort of big box stores. And that was largely driven by advances in these bake-offs, right? So it was a, seen as a, a really successful way to drive sort of incremental progress in the field. What happened in 2011 was that a team from Microsoft Research reported on one of the big standard data sets, a relative improvement of 33% in the accuracy of their uh, method compared to previous years. Now normally when you read a machine learning paper and you see an improvement of 33%, you sort of, you're skeptical, right? You think, well, they've done, they've cheated somehow. But these are, uh, you know, systems that people have, th this is a sort of a community effort. Um, and so it's really difficult to cheat and it turned out that you know, the, the results stood up to time. So, you know, whereas in previous years you're talking about one or two percent, suddenly 33 percent relative improvement. Everyone sat up and looked and what were they doing? They were doing this, a particular kind of deep neural network. And so that's really when I think a lot of the, the excitement started. This is when you started to see the things in the New York Times. You may remember this picture from 2012. I don't know if you can see that, but that's a cat. This is a cat recognizer. This is the internal representation of a cat's face from some huge um, deep neural network that Facebook was training at the time. They were able to show that they were able to do better image recognition with this gargantuan deep neural network than anyone had achieved uh, previously. Um, there have been lots of other successes. I'm sure you've heard of many of them since then. Um, and it's, uh, it's really quite impressive um, how rapidly they're going. This is a picture from the New York Times from uh, 2017. This is uh, Kie Jie. I think uh, Ki Jie is one of the, is the preeminent Go player in the world. And this is him reacting to losing to AlphaGo, which was a deep neural network uh, that was trained sort of from scratch to learn how to play Go, learn how to play it and beat the best uh, player in the world. This was a game, this is considered to be much more difficult than chess, which had already been uh, won several years before. Um, the impressive, or one of the impressive things about the sort of deep neural network stuff that's going on now is the variety of tasks that they've been applied to successfully. When um, Google first deployed their deep neural network solution in Google Translate, there was a huge bump up in the, uh, the level of accuracy in Google Translate. So when you are using your cell phone in a foreign country to translate stuff on the fly, all that stuff is being driven by this kind of deep neural network technology. You can also do things like this. This is uh, image reconstruction. So they've artificially eliminated part of the picture here and then asked the deep neural network to learn how to fill in the, the, the missing bits. You can imagine if you had some occlusion in, you know, some something in the way in your picture, you wanted to take it out, you could have the, the deep neural network fill it in for you. Um, that works well. There are also these sort of more somewhat uh, odd applications. This is another uh, set of images from the New York Times showing how a, a, a deep neural network learns to generate images of non-existent people. So this is an image of a woman that, was, that doesn't exist in the real world 
um, but was generated by training a network and then giving it a random number and it will generate a random picture of a person. And this is just the amount of training time. Um, and after 18 days, it's impossible to tell that that's not a real person. Um, <clears throat> just last week, this is a uh, New York Times article about how uh, uh, security company in Beijing is using real-time face recognition for tracking individuals. So these are pictures of you know, numeric identifiers of faces being tracked in real time, again, using deep neural network technology. Um, so that there's, a, there's sort of an obvious um, way that these two things come together. You have all of these solutions. You have a field, genomics, that is awash in data and not sure how to make sense out of it. And so the question is, how are we going to how are we going to put the two together? So what I wanted to spend the rest of the time doing is telling you about a few applications of how deep learning has been used successfully um, in genomics. <coughs> so uh, by way of background, let me first tell you about the ENCODE project. ENCODE stands for the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. Uh, it's sort of a, an NIH follow-on to the Human Genome Project. It was started in 2003. It's still ongoing. Um, and the basic idea was to try to figure out what are all the interesting functional elements in the human genome. And ENCODE has primarily been a data generation consortium um, with, the, with a side effort to try to understand all the data. Uh, but a big chunk of the effort was just to generate the data. The kinds of data that it's generating is all based on this, this high throughput sequencing technology I was telling you about, the ability to measure DNA bases quickly. Um, but actually you can use that technology not just to see, okay, it's an A here and a C here and a G there, but also to learn other properties of the DNA. So for example, you can learn things about how, what's the local packing density of the DNA. If you have a region of the DNA that's really all coiled up and bound tightly, it's very difficult for that DNA to do anything in a functional sense. So the degree of openness tells you something about whether that DNA is important for that particular cell that it's in or that type of cell. Um, protein binding I mentioned briefly before. There are different kinds of proteins. In fact, there's hundreds of different proteins that bind to the DNA. And those proteins are each doing different things. Uh, they might be turning the genes on or off, for example. And so we, we can have different measurements. Essentially, we can use this sequencing uh, technology to say, okay, for this particular protein, protein X, tell me where along the genome it's bound in this kind of cell, maybe in, in liver cells or in blood cells or what have you. <clears throat> and then you can also measure things like gene transcription, which means the gene is the, the region of the DNA and the transcription means that the gene is being copied and turned into some other product, usually a protein product. So you have measurements of all of these things. And the interesting thing is that there's hundreds, literally hundreds of these different kinds of measurements that you can make for any given kind of cell. Okay, so here's a matrix and I've got types of experiments along the vertical axis there. So you imagine each row in this matrix corresponds to one kind of measurement. I'm going to measure this protein. Where does it bind? Where does this other protein bind, et cetera? The thing is there's a whole bunch of different kinds of cells as well, right? You obviously have all the different kinds of tissues in your body. And that's not just neurons, but all the different types of neurons in your brain, for example, or um, all the subtypes of cells in any of your given complex tissues. But you also have um, the tissues at different stages in development. You have embryonic stem cells and then all the developmental stages that come, uh, the differentiation from the embryonic stem cells to the mature cells. And you can also imagine studying um, cells in um, people with different kinds of diseases and so on. So the, the, the horizontal axis here corresponds to types of cells and you can imagine here I've got a, maybe a couple hundred, but of course that could go uh, indefinitely. And what you're seeing is a picture of how many measurements were made by the ENCODE consortium over its first about 12 years or so. Okay, so you get a sense that there are some cells over on the right side there that they deemed really important. These are called tier one, tier two cells. We're going to study those with every assay we've got. 
And then there are some assays, some experiment types along the top that they thought were really informative. And so they would do those in all kinds of cells. But the problem is, imagine that you are a researcher who spends your time studying one particular kind of cell, um, and they didn't actually do the one experiment that you really wish that ENCODE had done. Each of these experiments costs a lot of money, which is why they haven't done all of them, right? I mean, m one of these sequencing experiments might cost on about $1,000 each, right? So filling out the whole matrix would be a huge endeavor. And it might not benefit that many people. Maybe it's just you and your small research group that studies that one kind of cell. It's hard to convince the ENCODE consortium to go generate that data for you. And so the question was, could we do something to try to figure out what that missing value was? Okay, so it turns out this is kind of similar to a, a seemingly totally unrelated problem. Uh, back in 2006, Netflix announced their Netflix prize competition. They offered a million dollars to people who could analyze their data for them successfully. And the problem was, we've got a bunch of people who subscribe to Netflix. They've all given us ratings for some of the movies. Uh, and we'd like to be able to predict what other movies they'd like in the future. Right? So we could tell them, here, you've seen, you've told us you like these 20 movies and you hate those 40 movies here's a set of movies that you, we think you'll really love, okay? So this was a huge deal. And uh, these are the guys who won the competition. And this is uh, the guy, Jeff Halbert, I wanted to tell you his story because he sort of motivated us starting along this uh, path. Jeff is a PH, has a PhD in organic chemistry. He worked in drug discovery for 20 years. He was getting late in his career. He thought this machine learning stuff was interesting. He heard about the Netflix prize. He thought, well, maybe I should learn about machine learning by trying to do this Netflix prize thing. So he got involved. He started working on it. And one of the things that people learned in this competition was that if you made multiple models and averaged them together, they worked better than any single model. And so what happened was there were all these teams competing, and they started grouping together and joining together and averaging their models. And Jeff got scooped into one of these bigger and bigger teams and his team actually crossed the finish line first, right? They had a, they had a thing that said, as soon as somebody gets an error rate uh, below X percent, competition's done. And Jeff's team crossed the line first. But then they also had a thing that said, well, but we hid some data. And so everybody who gets across the line within 24 hours after that, we're going to test them all on the held out data. And that's the final winner. And so even though he got across the line first, they got the million dollars because they were they actually did a little bit better on the, the hidden test set. So at that point, Jeff joined my lab. <laughs> and he said, well, hey, you know, this problem that you're trying to solve, it's really similar to the Netflix prize competition in the sense that you're doing imputation. You're saying we've got some values in this matrix and we're trying to fill in some other values in the matrix. The only difference is that now, instead of a matrix, we actually have more like a cube. And, it, and um, it's a totally invisible cube on this. <laughs> it's totally visible on my screen, but it's not visible on the slides, which I should have come down to check. But anyway, you just have to imagine it's a picture of a cube with some missing values. <laughs> OK? It's not there, but it's, it's over here. Afterwards, you can come see it. It doesn't really matter. The key point is that. Um, we figured we can try to use some of the same technology that you'd use for imputing the, the Netflix preferences, but use them instead to, instead of saying, you know, is Jeff Haubert going to like the movie Breaking Away? We want to know, is the protein CTCF going to bind at, in chromosome 12 at position 347,000 in a uh, liver cell? Those are the kind of predictions that we want to make. Um, and so what we do, ignoring the invisible left side of the slide, is we use a deep neural network. <clears throat> and we take the deep neural network, we learn these encodings for the different kinds of experiments. That's the thing in purple. The location along the genome, that's the thing in red. And the kind of cell that we're in. And we put it through the deep neural network and we, we train it to predict the value. And we do this in a supervised way because 
which means we have a bunch of data that ENCODE generated, and so we can feed that to the network and say, well, when you get this particular position and this cell type and this assay type, here's what the answer should be. And you use that same backpropagation algorithm that, the, that Rummelhart and McClellan popularized um, to train all the parameters of this model and make it give you predictions. And what, what we did was we hid some of the data from the network. So we trained it on a lot of the data, but then we held out 5% of the data that it had never seen and then said, how well can you do it predicting that? And so this is what you see. Each, of, each row here, this is one region of the genome, four different kinds of measurements. And the dark blue are the, the true values, and the filled in colors are the values that are predicted by the deep neural network. And so as you can see, it's pretty darn accurate. Now it's not exactly the same, um, but actually the measurements themselves, even if you do them twice, aren't exactly the same, right? So you expect to have some amount of variability in there. Um, so this is work that we just published, well, we just put on the web on um, Sunday and talked about at a conference on Monday. Um, and so the, it's now out there in the world. One of the things, the kinds of things that we're doing with this, besides, of course, making the, the model itself available, is to try to make these predictions available so that now, instead of somebody going to ENCODE and saying, oh, they didn't do my experiment, they can go to us and say, oh, actually, at least they predicted the experiment, and that's almost as good as having the real one there. Um, as one proof of concept, here's just a slide that I put as a reminder to myself to tell you this. I'm not going to explain what the slide means, but the point is one of the things that we did was used these deep neural networks to characterize a particular class of functional elements in the human genome called um, non-coding human accelerated regions. These are regions of the genome that fall outside of genes but show an evolutionary signature that shows that they're changing really quickly in the human lineage. So if you look at the human lineage back to chimp, for example, or um, you know, back to chimp, you see a lot of changes in the DNA. And that's evidence that there's something functionally interesting going on. And by looking at this expanded version of the ENCODE data set, where we now have all of the, of the experiments filled in, we were able to much better characterize what was going on in these human accelerated regions and identify some of them that, that hadn't been identified previously. So that's one example. Uh, second example, also from this department, um, comes from a collaboration actually between Stanfields in this department and, and Georg Selig, who's in uh, uh, bioengineering uh, and computer science. Um, and it has to do with the switches that turn genes on and off. So here's a uh, sort of a picture of some DNA you imagine someone told you there's one region here that's a gene, and in front of it, there is a switch that's responsible for turning that gene on and off. So what typically happens is that some protein comes down, uh, and binds to the switch, and when that binding happens, then the gene gets turned on, which means copies of that gene get expressed as proteins, okay? So what... Um, this group did, what Georg and Stan and their postdocs and grad students did, was figured out a way to sort of mimic this in a high throughput fashion, trying lots and lots of different DNA sequences. So on the left here, what you're seeing are variants of that switch sequence. So the colored bit would be where the switch is. And they're saying, we're going to go in and we're going to synthesize DNA sequences that look like the surrounding sequence, but then the variable region shown by the color there, we're going to randomize. So they generated half a million DNA sequences, each with different randomized bits in them. And then the idea was, in the, in the flask there, those are supposed to be little yeast molecules. What they did was they, they stuck these DNA sequences into yeast, the, the uh, one-celled organism yeast, and um, used that to measure how much that change to the switch affected the expression of the protein. So the measurements on the right are supposed to tell you, okay, if we put this color in, the protein goes really high. If we put this color in, then the protein goes really low. So the question is, now that they've automated this process, they've got 500,000 of these sequences, they can measure all of them in different yeasts, can we use that to train a deep neural network? And of course, I wouldn't be telling you uh, this story if you couldn't. The answer is yes. 
the idea is that you take a DNA sequence, you encode it for the neural network. This is just a schematic. It's actually a much bigger neural network than this one. But it goes through a multi-layer neural network, and out of the bottom comes a predicted protein level. Okay, so effectively what you have is the top is the experimental version, and the bottom is what we call the in silico version, right? This is the computational version of the same experiment. But now what you can do is compare, if you put in a new sequence that we haven't, that the, the network has never seen and predict the protein expression, how well does that correlate with what you get when you actually measure it in the, in the test tube set setup? And what you're seeing here, all these dots, are a comparison between the predicted protein level and the measured protein level. So you get a correlation of about 0.6. Uh, they're strongly correlated with each, with each other. And this is important because it allows us to do things like engineer yeast to, to solve important problems. You can use yeast for generating medicine, for example. And if you want to engineer it to, to express more genes, you can maybe use this kind of switch to control how much this gene is turned on or this other gene is turned on. You could also imagine using yeast for lots of other sort of industrial applications, processing biohazards and so on. Um, and then of course the other thing that's of course uh, very interesting here is that the mechanisms that yeast uses to turn on and off its genes are actually very similar to the ones that humans use. And so to the extent that this network might help us understand what are the changes in DNA that's causing changes in the expression of these proteins, those lessons may also apply uh, in the human genome. Um, okay, so then <coughs> the, uh, the, last pro the last project I wanted to tell you about uh, was actually carried out not here at the UW, but at Princeton by Olga Trons Troyanskaya's group. Um, and I actually heard her talk about this on, uh, on Monday at that same conference. Um, and it's a somewhat related problem, but it's, there's some important differences. So we're still thinking about uh, switches and genes and so on. Um, but now what I've showed here is that, well, let's back up a second. You've got this whole system, but now imagine that within the switch you just make one single change. You change, say, a C at a particular position into a G. Is that going to affect the rate at which that gene gets expressed as a protein? Um, and what Olga's group did was trained a deep neural network, um, something they called Deep C, to sort of solve this in a two-stage process. They again used that ENCODE data set that I told you about, but now what they're doing is taking the, the sequence as input and predicting all of these different properties from the ENCODE data set jointly. So you're predicting things like the DNA local packing density, all the different kinds of protein binding and so on. Um, and the key thing that they did was they used these measurements to then um, compare against uh, some data from real uh, individuals. So they trained this network and then they were able to go and look at a big collection of data from um, individuals with autism. And this is a particularly powerful data set because it's arranged into what are called quads. It means that you have one child who has autism and they have a sibling who does not have autism and neither parent has autism and they've done the DNA sequencing for all four people in the family. So what this means is that you can identify the genetic changes that happen only in that one child. It's not in either of the parents, it's not in the sibling. These are called de novo events because they happened sometime during um, when, the, when the child was uh, being conceived, right? So uh, the de novo events are the ones that may sort of tell us what's going on functionally uh, in, in uh, the, the autism spectrum disorder. And they were able to use their deep neural network to sort of study, okay, let's look at 127,000 different de novo mutations from this huge study of autism and use our deep neural network to predict which ones are likely to have the biggest effect on gene expression. Okay, so they were able to narrow this down and say, okay, <coughs> if we look at, um, and then they actually have some gene expression measurements from individuals with autism and the sibling, and they were able to show 
that the things that they identified correlated. So what you're seeing on the right, this is just a schematic, but the idea is that they could predict with their model that this particular gene, for example, would be more highly expressed when you have autism than when you do not, uh, based on the, the mutation, the predictions from their model. And in particular, <coughs> oops, oh yeah, that's right, so I didn't put that slide up, but, but the, in particular, they had nine um, individuals, or, or sorry, nine particular genes that they were able to go back to cell lines that were relevant and actually carry out the expression um, measurements in those nine cell lines um, and show that in fact, the, in, in nine out of nine cases, there was a strong change in the expression, the corresponding expression, uh, both at the level of the, well, in the expression of the protein. I'll leave it at that for simplicity. Okay, so now they've been able to link this not just to sort of what's going on within the cells in terms of who's binding where and so on, but they've brought it out of the cells and started to ask questions about um, how can that have impact on, on human disease. Um, and I was particularly pleased when I went to Olga's talk to see when she put up a picture of all the people who were participating in this project, one of the students was Chris Park who did his undergraduate in my lab. So all three projects kind of have connections to the UW. Um, Okay, so that's where we're at currently. There are tons of other places that deep neural networks are being applied, both in genomics and in proteomics, which is a closely related field studying proteins. Um, and I would say that what, where we are currently is that on the one hand, there's a ton of promise in terms of um, what kinds of problems we might be able to solve. On the other hand, um, it's becoming clearer that there are, you know, some kinds of problems that maybe deep neural networks aren't that well suited to. In particular, if you don't have a whole ton of data, uh, then you don't, then a deep neural network is not the right uh, solution for you. Um, and then I left this one here at the end because it's not really the end of the slideshow, it's the last slide because it's a picture of a black box, right? This is the, the other problem is that these deep neural networks are really hard to make sense of, right? That cat recognizer, the picture of the cat that I showed you, is one example where people were trying to squeeze out of the model some kind of story about why is it recognizing cats well. But in general, neural networks, and particularly deep neural networks, are hard to get, uh, get them to give you an explanation. They'll say, I think this is what's going on, but if you say why, they say, well, here I've got these two million parameters that I trained on 10 billion measurements and it's hidden in there somewhere uh, and good luck figuring it out. So that's what a lot of the research these days is going on, uh, is focusing on. There are a couple groups at the UW and, and places, people at lots of other places as well, developing methods for saying things like, okay, now you've given me all these answers, now go back and tell me which properties of each uh, observed data object are most important for explaining the particular prediction that you made. And so th that's particularly important for those questions like I alluded to, if we wanted to understand not just, you know, how does this sequence change the expression in yeast, but we want to know why so that we can then learn how it's working uh, and generalize from yeast to human, for example. So I think you should uh, keep watching the, the popular press. I'm sure you'll be hearing more success stories uh, from deep neural networks and genomics. Um, and of course, there will be other things coming along the line that we can't foresee as well. But I'm happy to answer questions if, they are, if there are any. And thank you very much for your attention.